the idea of we're going to move the all-star game because we think that this Georgia law, which requires ID to vote and doesn't allow people to give you water and food within 150 feet of the polling location, is supremely restrictive. But we're going to do business with a company backed by the CCP, well known for its Uyghur camps at this point. And now the Daily Wire broke this week at actual Christian camps as well, where they're forcing Christians to renounce their faith. Their faith. And by the way, how many elections are there in, in China? Well, and so, I, I know that there's drop boxes at all of them. Yeah. And early <laughs> so, voting. Right. There's, there's a, like 20 days of early voting in China, right. which is why that this is perfectly acceptable for Major League Baseball to do. Right. Thank you so much for being with us here on the program. If you like the program, be sure to like and subscribe and help us out to fight the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. And uh, up next, we have a very special guest, first time on the show. And frankly, I'm kind of surprised that I've never had him on the show before. It's a buddy of mine that works with me here at Faulkner, the Sports Information Director for Faulkner University, Jeremy Smith. Welcome to the program, Jeremy. Hey, brother. Thanks for having me. Yeah, always a pleasure to, to get to talk politics with you. We do mm -hmm. that an awful lot in our spare time. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, the reason that I brought you on, being a sports guy and everything, is I, I got to talk to you about Major League Baseball and what the heck is going on with the all-star game because I know football is king in Alabama. I get it. You like mm -hmm. your football and I do too. I'm mm -hmm. an Auburn grad, but I'm a baseball guy and always mm -hmm. have been. That'll always be my number one sport. And I've been a Braves fan since when I was four years old, before I was even in kindergarten, I could name the Braves starting lineup, yep. the crime dog and everybody. So like when I found out they're taking the all-star game away from Braves and I, I feel like there's a lot of people in central Alabama that feel that way. There's not another big uh, Major League Baseball team anywhere near here. And right. so this is Braves country. So how do you think this affects the uh, the local baseball fans? Well, in the immediate, it starts with those people who were going to try to make the trip, who were going to try to go to Atlanta, who wanted to go to the Home Run Derby. Or, and you can't even quantify the amount of just – walk-up traffic, mm -hmm. people who wouldn't even have tickets, but they would have hung out in the battery. They would have hung out in the area and what they would have done just to be near it and be part of it. My son mm -hmm. and I talked um, as far back as three years ago when, when the announcement was made that Atlanta's getting the All-Star game. We marked it down, my wife and I did, that we, we want to take our, our son, who's now eight, and he's been excited. He knows as he tracks everything related to baseball. Right. And so he knew for the last year and a half, hey, the Braves are going to get the All-Star game. And he would bring it up. Hey, uh, are we going to go to the Home Run Derby? Yeah. And we were going to try. Well, not now. Uh, and so, I know. All the stuff surrounding the All-Star game, for, if you're not a baseball fan, you don't realize it. Because, I mean, the Pro Bowl, nobody cares about the Pro no. Bowl. Nobody watches the All-Star game for the NBA. No. It's like Disney World for a baseball fan. Yeah, it's like huge. that and Cooperstown are right. the two big things. Right, and that's one of those. You know, you can go to a game in every major league stadium eventually because mm -hmm. there's a, there's 81 home games a year per team. Right, there's a lot of options. There's one All Star game a year. You're not going to get a lot of options to go to those. And when you look at the cycle on on how long it takes. Maybe Rob Manfred does the right thing. It'd be the first time. But maybe <laughs> Rob Manfred does right. the right thing, and he comes back in a couple of years when all of this dies down, and he gives it back to Atlanta, and, and we cycle back into it in a few years. But th there's no guarantee of that. And uh, I, I think the just, chances of that are very slim, frankly. Right. Um, it, uh, they're, they're probably higher if Rob Manfred's not commissioner anymore, which would be the best thing baseball could do for itself. Absolutely. So, uh, it's the worst worst commissioner in North American professional sports. Yeah, to take a break from the politics for just a second and yeah. just talk sports, I do not understand a baseball commissioner whose big, like, you know, his, his legacy to the sport is supposed to be, let's figure out a way to give people less of our product. I like baseball. I want it to last longer. If right. they made it 12 innings, I would watch all 12 innings of it. So you're telling me Rob Manfred is the Joe Biden of Major League Baseball. <laughs> like, he <laughs> hates the very thing he's been elected to take care of. That, so. that's, a, that's actually a darn good uh, analogy. Though. Right. In fact, they, uh, he just appointed a guy today who's like a rabid gun control nut mm -hmm. uh, to put in charge of the ATF, uh, right. al alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. So it's kind of the same thing. Well, and he makes the statement that, you know, America is an, an international embassy embarrassment like right what would rob manfred say about his own sport you know uh and you've yeah, seen I don't, these I don't things get that. right you've seen him throughout you know the, mike trout the, the you go back to the mike trout thing a few years ago right and he was asked about mike trout and not being this household name and this big star even though he could be the best player to ever play the game by some metrics yeah and and I agree. rob manfred's answer is that like mike trout doesn't want to promote himself that's not his job 
And so yeah. Manfred has no interest in doing his own job, which is promoting. And then the most recent thing, we'll skip all over the Astros thing, the inflatable <laughs> trash cans. Right. But, but the, the thing that gets me is we went into the offseason with both the owners and the Players Association. Reportedly, mm. both of them wanted the DH in the National League and yet didn't agree – to get the DH in the National League because Rob Manfred is so dysfunctional as a leader that he can't even come to an agreement about two things that people have already agreed on. So it's just, it's really, Maybe it's you really should frustrating. Read the deal. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. So highly but, frustrating. But yeah, getting back into the politics, of course, sure, the, yeah. the rationale behind this, and um, this is one of the reasons that I like talking to you, and I, I'm, I hate that I don't have the clip, but there's been uh, clips of people on uh, ESPN sportscasters talking about the politics that get literally everything wrong right. about the politics. Uh, I was watching, and I cannot remember the guy's name, but the commentator the other night that went on this like five-minute rant about how evil and racist the Georgia law is, and it... <sighs> First of all, he got all of his facts wrong. Right. Um, well, because facts don't matter. Well, and, and he's so. probably getting all of this from, uh, you know, a handful of Twitter uh, people that he follows and he thinks because he reads some some tweets from a couple politicians, he's well informed. Right. Um, but, you know, most sports guys, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not going after him because I couldn't, I'm a politics guy. I couldn't just do talk sport, you know, talk sports for uh, ever. Right. I, I, could, I couldn't do that. I, I don't have that skill set. But but they think that they have it with their – but you actually know the politics of this stuff, and yeah. that's one of the reasons I, I ask you to come on here. And one of the things that, that he said and that has been repeated over and over and over again is how uh, obstructive and uh, how it's how the law is specifically designed to keep black people and other minorities from voting. So w w what's your take on that? Well, that's a talking point for sure. Um I have yet to see any evidence that that's the case. Um, it, because whenever you're talking about these things, mm -hmm. you have to compare them to to a similar ilk. That's what you got to start with. Right. So if you say that the Georgia law is racist, the follow-up question is as compared to what? And no one's asking the question as compared to what? Right. Is this law more restrictive or less restrictive than previous Georgia laws? Well, if you look at it, it's actually less restrictive than previous Georgia laws if you read the laws verbatim. Right. By any measure, right. this expands voting access. Right. Okay. So now we have to look at other states. Is this law more restrictive or less restrictive than most of the laws in the books in other states? Mm -hmm. And by most of the metrics we're seeing, it's less restrictive than most of the laws in other states. In fact, it's less restrictive than the law in, say, Colorado, where Major League Baseball has moved the All-Star Game to. Right, Coors Field. So the, the, the All-Star Game now goes to Denver, right. which is a 75-80% white population. Uh, I believe it's because I did look this up the other day. Yeah. It's 69% white yeah. and 10% black. Okay, so now and, this 100... And that's compared to Atlanta, which is... 50% black. <laughs> right. So this hundred plus million dollar economic boon that's going to happen, you've now moved into a predominantly white area and out of a predominantly black area because you're not racist. Well, and, and so that's like, it, it's, it's the fallout of this. Like all of these things are, it's, it's 280 characters and that's all I needed to see. And now I understand everything I need to know. Right. And I'm going to make a decision about this. And tr Truthfully, Major League Baseball did it because of the tweet. They did it so they can put it out there in 280 characters that we did it. Because oh, it's literally in their public statement that they made that this is because Joe Biden brought it up. Right. They, they literally say that in their press release. Yeah, and so, but when you look at the fallout, they move it to a place with more restrictive laws. So clearly they don't care that much about the law. Well, I don't know they're, if they're, they're actually more restrictive. It's similar. So, for example, in Colorado, they have 15 days of early voting. Right. In Georgia, this... New law expands 17. it to 17 or 19, depending on which counties want right. to add a couple of extra days. Right. Uh, when you look at whether or not there is a, a voter ID, mm -hmm. both require a voter ID. Both, right. Um, now, Jen Psaki, the press secretary for the president, the other day tried to make a comparison and say, no, no Co Colorado is actually much uh, more accessible than Georgia. And her point was there's a lot more mail-in voting, and they send it out to 100% of people. First of all, she gets her facts wrong because it sends it out to 100% of registered voters right. not every citizen gets it and how do you get registered for your mail-in ballot 
you. You bring a photo you ID. You gotta have an ID, right. And so by any measure, these laws are similar. And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the Georgia law actually add some ballot boxes that it, more than what there were? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Okay. Because if you're looking at the Georgia law pre-COVID, mm -hmm. then um, yes, because ballot boxes were literally not a thing in right. the election before coronavirus. Right. And then because of concerns about the coronavirus, they added mailboxes or these drop boxes. And then they realized, you know what? Leaving giant receptacles for votes unattended outside where anyone could access them 24 hours a day with no surveillance is a really dumb idea. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep the boxes. We're just going to keep them inside the polling place. Right. So somebody could see them and, and if there was any tampering they would know about it right that's all they did which seems perfectly reasonable to me it, it does but listen this it's interesting that it's georgia and colorado mm -hmm. that are the, the talking point here because of what baseball backed itself into because it wasn't that long ago that you could compare what brian kemp was doing in georgia with opening back up in the midst of this pandemic still in sort of the early stages mm -hmm. and colorado whose orders from the governor's office were very, very similar. And the media destroyed, destroyed Brian Kemp in Georgia mm -hmm. they, for their murderous experiments. Whereas the exact same thing was happening with the Democratic governor in Colorado and the conversations weren't taking place. So like, what you've ultimately arrived at is another example of the fact that n everything is in a vacuum. Nothing is compared to anything else. Like the, I think one of the most important phrases you can have in life is as evidenced by. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is a racist law as evidenced by or as compared to what, like we mentioned earlier. Right. And that, that, that but, was But you don't go point. down there. I, yeah. I don't think that Georgia's law is more open or disenfranchises, uh, disenfranchises voters less. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that either one really does that, either Colorado or Georgia. But my point in all of this is you can't say the law is racist in Georgia when they have virtually exactly the same law in Colorado and it's not racist. Right. There. That so, doesn't make any sense. So then you break down to why then? Like mm -hmm. if, if the law in Colorado is the same as the law in Georgia, why did you do this? And the answer is the answer to everything right now. Because somebody wanted us to, and a very loud somebody wanted us to. It's it, that's the answer, and and it's it's not that you care, and that's probably the most frustrating part. If Rob Manfred and Tony Clark uh, looked at this and said, "We really believe that this is a problem," then it the onus is on them to take this All Star Game to a place that has incredibly open, unrestrictive voting laws. That makes a statement. But when you make the lateral move, all you do is say, we really don't actually care about the issue. This is virtue signaling. Which actually, I think, is the correct interpretation of all of this. Right. So it was more about the appearance of doing something noble than actually doing something noble. And right. I don't, I don't think pulling it out of, you know, Atlanta was noble in the first place. Right. But they were really a lot more worried about the perception mm -hmm. than they were. And one thing that we learned just recently is that there was actually kind of a focus group kind of thing that went on that helped to go into this decision making, uh, which included 50 minority players, including, and I really hated this because I'm a fan of his, mm -hmm. and I was at his very first uh, major league debut game mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Jason Hayward was one right. of the ringleaders of this. Um, but here's the thing. There were only 50 players in it. How many Major League Baseball players are there, including minor league and everything else? Uh, just from a Major League standpoint, uh, and guys that are close to the bigs, you're looking at over a thousand players easily. So, and 50 players made yeah. this decision that affected the entire league and the city of Atlanta. Right. So it, that that's a problem. Um, and then I begin to look at some of the other angles on this thing that I haven't really heard talked about. Like one of the things I believe that I, that uh, that came up was that Coke Coke was pushing for Major League Baseball to move this thing out of Georgia. Well, Woca-Cola has gotten but, su substantially more on the left bend here recently. But I don't where know is why. Coke headquartered? Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So are they going to close down World of Coke in Atlanta because this law is racist? But no. Well, go going according to their standard, then they should move it to Denver. For sure. Yeah. 100%. And, <laughs> well, and I mean, it's like Marco Denver. Rubio tweeted it at, um, at Rob Manfred. Like, are you going to renounce your membership in, at Augusta National? Right. So... Uh, so there's all of these elements in there, but then there's, a, there's, this is compared to most readily the NBA pulling its all-star game out of Charlotte. Mm. So 
The NBA pulled its All-Star game out of Charlotte because of the law that was on the books regarding the bathroom. We get that, 2015. This right. happened NCAA before. did the same thing with the tournament. Right, so there's precedent. I don't think that that's apples to apples, to apples though, because the NBA is a salary cap league. No matter how much revenue the Charlotte Bobcats or Hornets or whatever they're called, they were called in 2015 yeah. might have generated from that, it wasn't going to affect the competitiveness on the floor. I think this could have an impact on Atlanta from a competitive standpoint because they're coming off of this COVID year where there was no revenue. There were no ticket sales. Right. The event staff and event people have been impacted more than even the restaurant right. industry. And, and from a competitive standpoint, just from the sports a avenue, baseball's not a salary cap sport. So – this brings a hundred million dollars economic impact into the area. What does it bring into the Braves organization specifically mm -hmm. that they then are able to turn around from those attendance numbers, those ticket sales, and maybe go get an extra arm at the trade deadline, or maybe go go make a move that they can't do because this thing that was in their budget that they were counting on coming before the trade deadline, mind you, isn't there anymore coming off of the worst economic year in the history of North American professional sports. Right. So this, this virtue signaling decision that has no real impact as it pertains to the law or the way anybody feels about the law has only accomplished two things. Mm -hmm. It's made people, many people, stop watching your sport. Rob Manfred's awesome at that. It's made people stop watching your sport and now it could potentially have an actual impact on, on the Braves in terms of what their bottom line looks like and what that allows them to do. Because as a Braves fan, you know, Liberty Media doesn't like to spend a lot of money. And anything <laughs> that... Wrong. Right. And, and the battery itself, one of the things people don't realize is like the battery itself is a real estate venture for Liberty Media. That's what that is. And so bringing that revenue in at the battery is positive for Liberty Media, which mm -hmm. affects the bottom line positively for Atlanta, which affects the on-field product, uh, product. And now all of that has a brand new little variable thrown in there because of Rob Manfred. Well, you've touched on something really interesting, and I want to expound on it a little bit because here's the thing that people that may not necessarily follow baseball like you and I do need to realize about it. Truist Park is brand new. For sure. It's terrible a, name, but yes. Yes, it is terrible yeah. name. Um, th they're... Well, we won't get into that. Yeah. Here all day. SunTrust was a great name. SunTrust was a good name. Yeah. But either way, um, the, the new park there, it's an investment. They, they it sunk is. a lot of money into it, probably partially because of the possibility mm. of getting a big event like the All-Star Game. Um, th that was probably some of the forethought in, in building the new park because, you know, Turner Field, what are, what are the odds you're going to get a, uh, an All-Star Game in there? Right. Um, all of the investment that goes into... Uh, the battery, the surrounding areas, your hospitality, th that's where all that $100 million comes from. And then there's the added expense that we really have no way to calculate that you just talked about right. in the um, added fans, more people wanting to come see it, that kind of thing, that generated interest from the All-Star Game. So we're talking bare minimum $100 million, possibly significantly more. Right. And what Major League Baseball did, was take all of that money from a majority black area mm -hmm. where there's a lot of black business owners and black employees that would have benefited directly from the all-star game right. and moved it to an incredibly white community. Right. And here's the thing. Even the guy that's living in downtown Atlanta has voted for Democrats his entire life um, politically aligns with your Joe Bidens or your Kamala Harris's much more so than somebody like you or I. Do you think that guy is really thrilled with what they've done here? Even if he doesn't like the Georgia law, they've just kicked the bucket out from under this guy. Right. And, and that's what's really sad about this. Well, and I think you're already starting to see the backlash from this because you're starting to see Jen Psaki and Joe Biden and even Stacey Abrams back away from the idea that this was a good idea. like, Or at the very least, back away from the idea that they had something to influence right. that decision. Right. And so... Yeah, the backlash is going to come, unfortunately, for Major League Baseball. Um, they're going into a, a very important year. Like the, the collective bargaining agreement is going to expire. Mm -hmm. They are probably headed to a strike, it, as evidenced by the fact that 
both the Players Association and the owners wanted the DH in the National League, and they couldn't even agree to that. How are they going to agree to a collective bargaining agreement? So you're going to go from this worst year in North American professional sports history for everybody in this COVID year with no revenue into this year where you began the year by kicking your fan base in the groin mm -hmm. and saying that politics are now a part of sports. Whereas most baseball fans actually go, I don't really want it to be. Like, I don't want it to be a part of sports. I don't want to think about those things. I want to watch baseball. So you've now brought them back into the conversation again, mm -hmm. and you're headed into what's probably going to be a strike-shortened year or a lockout year because they can't agree to terms on a collective bargaining agreement. You're going to murder the sport. I mean, this was this was it. This and, was and the baseball year. Baseball was already struggling in that right. area. Right. That's the problem. Right. This was the year to make a move and try to gain. And I think they've alienated a lot of fans who won't. They they just won't watch it. Yeah, it really is. It really is sad. And and here's the thing. And this goes to one of the larger points that I've been making for years now. When it came to because baseball seemed to be the one sport that was kind of a holdout on all of this and trying to stay out of the politics as much as possible. Right. Uh, the NFL already dipped, you know dipped its toe in it with the Colin. Kaepernick thing, NBA, like they just dove in face first. Yes, they were baptized into it. Right. Yes. And, and but baseball has always been, at least in the, the recent years, seemed to kind of stay out of it as much as possible. Right. And now they've kind of uh well in a in a big way they've jumped into it. And so here's the thing that I keep saying. I'm worried about the country mm -hmm. because if we have lost all of our common spaces, because if you were a baseball fan are you really worried that there might be a whole bunch of Democrats in the stadium with you? No, no you can bond over the fact that you like baseball. Right. Um, and, and that helps heal some wounds. And I'm worried that we're leading to a country that's not just divided in the terms of our political disagreements, but they're destroying all the spaces that might have given us a reason to listen to one another and get to know one another on a level other than politics. Right. Now everything's filtered through politics and we have nowhere to just, you know, get get a release, sit back, and, right. and maybe meet, meet some people we wouldn't meet outside the political arena that have different political ideas than we do. Well, and this is, you know, I, I mean, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe sports actually comes from a French word that means to take away. The idea being that the whole point of sports was to be taken away from these other things. That right, that's it's escapism. That's it. That's that's the whole point. That's that's all of it. That's everything. And that's been true since the Alexander the Great days. Right. And that was one of the, the best parts about I think baseball personally is the best sport to attend in person. Because mm -hmm. you can sit and you can talk and I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a game and met somebody next to me or in, right in front of me in the section and started to talk to them. And you can't do that necessarily at football or at basketball where the action's constant. You can do that at baseball. Mm -hmm. And baseball is a wonderful place for that, where people who don't look like you and people who don't think like you are wearing the same jersey that you're wearing. Mm -hmm. And you can really, truly share that. And you can really, truly have that moment. And I don't actually care who you voted for. I don't actually care who you're going home with. I don't care about any of those things. In this moment, Ronald Acuna is up in the bottom of the seventh and we're down two. Mm -hmm. And that's all we care about. That doesn't matter anymore. Everything culturally is all about how you vote and whether it is the correct way. Because the idea that there is a way that is correct or incorrect is what permeates all of culture now. That you must think like me and, and ultimately it comes down to, and this gets into your broader philosophical stuff that we won't, don't have time to go down to, <laughs> right. but, but ultimately it comes down to self-worship. Like that's it. That's the idea of everything. You must think like I do, vote like I do, be like me, because that validates and affirms me. And I can't be wrong. I am wonderful. And so I think this, this self-worship is sort of at the core of all of this. And, uh, and people don't like conflict and disagreement or the cognitive dissonance that comes from new ideas and different ideas. And the beauty of sports is just none of those ideas matter right now. We're, we're here right. for a game and that's what matters. And it's gone. Um, I, I don't think it's coming back uh, to be honest with you, because if baseball can be influenced to do something like this, 
Right, specifically trying to alter a state's voting policy right. because they don't, you know, we're going to take, literally in this case, take our ball and go home right. if you don't play the way that we want you to. Right. And getting involved in politics. Right. So, you know, what happens in Texas and Florida, mm -hmm. states that are going to be most likely to pass laws that the left do not agree with? How are the Rangers going to do? How are the Marlins going to do? The Astros will probably do well. They've already gotten away with plenty. But how do you, like, how, uh, how, what's going to happen there? Because now you've set a precedent if you're baseball. Because here's what you know about the left if you're paying attention in culture. Mm -hmm. One thing is never enough. If you do one thing, there's always something else. Oh, that's it's, why I've said whether you're a company or whether you are an individual, the stupidest thing you can do at this point is to give in and apologize for something that the left deems, um, you know, beyond... Because here's the thing, and, and this comes down to a worldview thing that you were kind of hinting at earlier. There is no such thing as forgiveness in the church of leftism. No. With Christianity, it's the core of the whole religion. Right. With leftism, it's you bow down and kiss the ring and you will conform just like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And because of that, when you step out of line, there is no forgiveness for that. Right. And so I think they're just kidding themselves. And I think base, you know, Major League Baseball is a part of this, that if you go along to get along, then you know, you'll be okay with us. That never happens. And you would think after this happens time and time and time again to different companies, like Chick-fil-A basically caved. Right. Have, have the leftist attacks on Chick-fil-A stopped? No, no. And they never will. No. And they're not going to. No. And that's the point. Um, Ultimately, that, that's what's going to happen is comply or be destroyed, and that is their mantra. Mm -hmm. and, and really, that's the thing, though, when you, when you talked about the uh, self-worship. This all goes back to the idea that wokeism and, and leftism is a collectivist mindset. Right. It's possible to coexist with someone that disagrees with you and, and go out and, and watch a ball game with them. That's something that you can do if you're an individualist. Mm -hmm. It's not possible if you're a collectivist At all. because I need society to validate me. If you're a Christian, for example, you know, I only care about whether or not I'm right with God, mm -hmm. whether or not society agrees with me is really immaterial. Right. And so, but with, with leftism, they need that to validate them because their only standard is what society says. And because mm -hmm. of that, they have to have that shift and conform to their beliefs or else it doesn't work anymore. Right. And so that's the difference. And this gets into the broader strokes of, you know, the underlying narrative of, of or idea rather of your entire show mm -hmm. that ultimately we can have these conversations and we can talk about this because you and I both believe that there is an unshakable, unchangeable, absolute foundation that undergirds all of this. Right. So you have to, you have to have that. If you don't, if society is what dictates that which is right and that which is wrong, that's an ever-changing target. That is mm -hmm. a constant moving target, and you cannot ever hit it at all. It's const constantly relative and constantly subjective, and, and that's how you get to where we are now, that things that 10 years ago – I mean, we, we're, we're – large chunks of our society are advocating for things that 10 years ago – collectively all of us would have said that's horrible we can't do that oh i mean that a great illustration of that is uh, a bunch of your leftists now are coming out and talking about how horrible friends is right and i'm like okay friends is the show that had rachel have a baby out of wedlock mm -hmm. and one of the main characters ross has a divorced lesbian wife that mm -hmm. he attends the wedding of. Like, th there's incredibly leftist themes in the show all throughout, but they're all saying right. they occasionally make things that are, they make jokes that are um, insensitive to women or insensitive to homophobia. I'm like, if this is how fast the Overton window is moving, right. literally nobody can keep up. No, it can. And ultimately, it all will circle back around again. And that that's just the way that it has to go. Right. Because if the target constantly moves, eventually you've got to realize that the target is an absolutely impossible standard and that no one is acceptable and you should let all of this go or you're going to end up with an amount of anxiety that no one can live with. And, and that's sort of where we are. And do you know what is really nice when you have all this anxiety? A baseball game. <laughs> well, you ruined that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I was going to ask one other thing about sure. this as well. 
Um, I understand that baseball is working very hard right now to expand its uh, viewer base into China. Yeah. Now, so I that's the rumors. interesting thing. Have you, have you I, read about the deal that took place a week before? Uh, no, I, ha I have not. Okay. So, and I don't come to me for specifics because I've got four, four children at home. I'm very tired. So, <laughs> um, but Major League Baseball agreed to terms with a CCP backed company mm -hmm. a week before deciding that or announcing that they were going to move the All-Star game. So the idea of we're going to move the All-Star game because we think that this Georgia law, which requires ID to vote and doesn't allow people to give you water and food within 150 feet of the polling location, is supremely restrictive. But we're going to do business with a company backed by the CCP, well known for its Uyghur camps at this point. And now the Daily Wire broke this week uh, uh, actual Christian camps as well, where they're forcing Christians to renounce their faith. Their faith. And by the way, how many elections are there in, in China? Well, and so, I, I know that there's drop boxes at all of them. Yeah. And early so, voting. Right. There's, there's a, like 20 days of early voting in China, right. which is why that this is perfectly acceptable for Major League Baseball to do. Right. Like, so, and, and that's it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. I they mean, have literal concentration yeah. camps. Yeah. But the Georgia law is, according to President Biden, Jim Crow 2.0, that's beyond the pale. We can't have an all-star game in Georgia because of that. Right. Which here's the thing. I said for a long, I, I said this from the very beginning. If that's how restrictive and evil it is, mm -hmm. why do they still have a team in Georgia? Right. Like move the Braves somewhere well, else. Well, and so that, that's what's so fascinating is that the thing that the Braves did that most impacted a black community and a large portion of, of, of black citizens negatively came when they moved to SunTrust Park. Right. Like that's the irony of all of this, that, that at Turner Field, they were right there in Atlanta and the economic boom to the area was big. But if you had ever gone to Turner Field, especially in the latter years, you know it, it, it wasn't great parking. There were all sorts of issues. They right. picked up and they moved out of this and they moved to East Cobb, which is – Far more white. Now, there's, uh, as you outlined, the people impacted by this move, you have a tremendous amount of, of black employees of the Braves who are going to benefit. Tremendous amount of black employees there in the battery who are going to benefit. And there's the trickle down of the economics. But right. the Braves themselves picked up and moved out of this largely black area and moved into a largely white area. And no one said anything about it at that time. Well, loudly. Um, now, uh, there's this voting rights law that's passed, and that actually, from what I've read, I've seen several places that have said that that um, most registered black voters, I think it was around 70% of registered black voters support voter ID. That, so, oh, yeah, so, it's, it's like 80 in the general pop. Right. And so this is an overwhelmingly, can you think of anything right. Americans 80% of us agree on? Right. Virtually nothing. Right. And so, so this thing doesn't actually affect black Americans at all. But, well, the, but now, Jeremy, I have to correct you on that. <laughs> you know, black people are way too stupid to be able to get their own IDs or to be able to go online to figure out how to vote. And by the way, that's not me saying that. That's the president of the United right. States saying right. that they aren't intelligent enough right. to be able to, to figure out how to vote, to be able to get their own ID. By the way, Georgia, you can get one for free if you don't want to get a driver's license. You can literally have... I, I see black drivers. I mean... Right. I, there's I, not they're a, getting driver's license somehow. There's not um, a lot that, that you can do that doesn't require an ID. And so that's why the voter ID thing, uh, being specifically racist, has always been a controversial question for me because I don't understand it. I mean, uh, the idea right, of... people have IDs? Right. I, apparently not. Uh, apparently and, there's something I'm missing. And here's the other thing, too. The whole, uh, you know, not being able to give people water thing, which, by the way, is a complete lie. Yeah, that's not um, the way the law is written at all. Yeah, there's absolutely no truth to it whatsoever. Right. Um, because if your spouse is thirsty and you want to go get water, you can. Right. Uh, and and even all they're saying is a, a stranger, a campaign worker wearing a vote for Biden or vote for Trump shirt can't go around handing out bottles of water. To right. People. They can even bring water if they want to and set it up as long as it's unmanned. All right. this is saying is that they cannot 
basically campaign and give you gifts in line, right. which, by the way, is a law that Colorado also has. Right, right. So, but, but that aside, and here's the craziest thing, too. That's only within 100 feet of a voting place. They literally can walk up saying, hey, I will give you this bottle of water if you will vote for Joe Biden as long as they're 100 feet away. Right. What is that, like a first down? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it ain't much. It's not a lot. You know, three three feet a yard, 100 feet, you're looking about 30 yards, you know. And you're an Auburn fan, so 30 yards is a first down a lot of times. So, <laughs> you're not wrong. You know, so, um, oh, look, we jumped off sides again. That's right. That's, and Bonick scrambles yeah. back, and that's a sack. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, but but it's 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 a frustrating thing. And, and the thing is this. There's a lot of problems that we do have that we need to talk about. Sure. And a, a lot of people who would all like to attend that all-star game would actually agree on a lot of those problems, but we can't get to that. Um, I, th I think one of the – it's so simple and it's not elegant, but one of the best things I've seen any sports commentator say in the last year – was the Charles Barkley statement? I was last actually going to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, that that I mean, and Barkley is a very is is I mean, he's from Leeds, Alabama. He is a very simple way of putting things, but he's not wrong. And this is not an exclusively left thing. This, the, the, you've got plenty of people that are political leaders more toward the right side of the aisle who also enjoy the gaps between people because they see a place to optimize their own successes in the gaps between the citizenry. Right. It's a way to make political hay. That's, That's it. The, the thing about Charles Barkley and, you know, um, hometown guy, me being an Auburn person, big fan of his, the man voted for and not just voted for, campaigned for Doug Jones. Yeah. I do not see a lot politically eye to eye with Charles Barkley. Right. But what he said there is – common sense mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people on the left and the right that benefit from the divides which For is sure. absolutely true and i watched that and i was just like i don't i don't see the controversy no there's no controversy there the problem is that charles wasn't supposed to say it that was the problem now charles does excel and i know that he would hate making this comparison but charles and trump have one thing in common they are excellent at saying the quiet part out loud. Oh, for sure. The, I will never forget. And sometimes the, when Trump does it, it annoys me. But the point is, right. they're both good at it. I'll never forget, oh man, however many years ago it's been when the Dallas Mavericks had brought the very first Chinese-born Chinese, uh, Chinese -born player to the NBA. Mm -hmm. uh, Wang Juju, I think it was. And so... This game is on TNT, and they're doing they're doing the broadcast about how big of a deal this is that it's the very first Chinese-born player in the USA mm -hmm. uh, in in the NBA, and then uh, Ernie kicks it over to Chuck, and Chuck immediately says, because this is during the time that there had been a helicopter crash uh, and some American citizens were being held by the Chinese government, mm -hmm. and immediately Chuck goes, I don't think you should be allowed to play till we get our people back. And so, and you see Ernie on air go, uh... <laughs> and so, that's Chuck. He's gonna say the quiet part out loud. He's gonna... Right. But, but unfortunately, the quiet part out loud has become the, the stuff that we should all be willing to say and the stuff that we should all be willing to recognize, which is that what your politicians tell you about your neighbor isn't true. You need to go talk to your neighbor. And well, I can't you, believe that him saying, I really believe that most white people are good people. That's the controversial thing to say now? Right. And so the, the idea, and if you look at just sort of everything that's happened over the last year plus is – it's it's a collectivist mindset that benefits off of separating everybody from each other. It does. And, and that's what's happened over the last year is we've gone to our homes. We've stopped talking to people. We've become afraid of our neighbors. We think that, that Twitter is real life and Facebook is real life and all these things are real life. We stopped having conversations with people because all of the points where those conversations are supposed to happen are now regulated or eliminated. Mm -hmm. And the best place to have one of those conversations, oh, by the way, is a baseball game. Yeah. Like, well, one last, and you can't do it anymore. One last thing that I wanted to bring you up, and I know that this is something that is not uh, unpolarizing, but it really should be because it's hysterical. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you, like me, are a big fan of the Babylon Bee. Oh, it cracks me up, yeah. Yeah, I think the Babylon Bee just absolutely hit the nail on the head when they released the headline that Major League Baseball will no longer require photo ID to buy beer. 
Yeah, that was – and the funny thing was I had actually made that that, that joke to somebody. Right. Um, the, like as soon as baseball announced this, it was mm-hmm. like, well, photo ID is, is racist. I'm like, so black people can't buy beer? That's what you're telling me? Like because black people clearly don't have IDs. They're, and so it doesn't make sense at all. And so so now either we, we stop IDing people for our beer sales or we stop selling beer in Major League ballparks. Which one of those two you think they're going to do first? Right. Well, he, here's what – Here's what it all boils down to, and I'm going to try to pull a Charles Barkley here and super simplify it. Um, If that is the case, if it's if photo ID is not racist in virtually every facet of American life, whether it's uh, buying a firearm or getting on an airplane or buying alcohol or Mm -hmm. buying cigarettes or, or any of those things. Picking up your will call tickets at a baseball game. Right. Picking up your tickets at a baseball game, getting a passport, all of those things. It's it's not racist there but it is racist for this one very specific thing, which is voting, then first of all, the obvious conclusion is, okay, it's not really racist. Mm -hmm. And then the second conclusion that you have to draw to, because you have to ask yourself, why are they saying it's racist in this one specific instance when it's not racist anywhere else? Mm -hmm. It must be because they have a vested interest in not requiring ID Mm -hmm. in this one particular instance in American life. So the side that is claiming that everything was on the up and up, that there was no fraud, that it was a perfect election, that there are not people that are, you know, going around and and voting when they shouldn't be, Mm -hmm. is also the side that is claiming, but we shouldn't have any way to check that. (laughs) Right. If if, if you were a college student, for example, let's say you were somebody that really liked alcohol and wanted to buy alcohol, and and I was in a fraternity at Auburn, I I get it, people, I know people do this. Mm -hmm. Um, If you were not 21 yet, and you wanted to get beer, would you rather there be a system where you do have to check photo ID or where you do not? The answer is obvious. You would want the one where you don't check it. So the person that's not supposed to vote or the person that would rather people that aren't supposed to vote be able to vote, they're going to be the ones favoring the system where you don't check it. It's just that simple. Right. But they try to make it complicated with the race thing. Right. And it's a distraction. That's all it is. And, and, Unfortunately, and this is, I've had this conversation with a lot of people over the last year, and, and I think that these things need to be, they need to be acknowledged. They, they need to be said. Sure. Um, there are numerous students on my staff that are black students, and they sit in my office and they talk all the time. And I listened to four, uh, four young black men a few weeks ago sitting in my office talking with each other about their experiences of actual experienced racism in which they were uh, they were made to feel a certain way or they were treated a certain way based mm-hmm. solely upon their skin color. That's the stuff that has to be dealt with. That's the stuff that we have to get rid of. Those are the things that we should be able to have conversations sure. about. But every time you take that word racism and you throw it up against something that's not even racially informed, let alone racist, then you minimize the real things that have to be dealt with. Right. Because you have the boy who cried wolf mentality and people assume that if, if there is a, a portion of the population Mm -hmm. that anytime they use the word racism or talk about racism, it's something that's not racism and actually just has something to do with a political agenda. Right. Then people start thinking that when people legitimately talk about their experiencing uh, experiences where they did experience racism, that they must be seeking after a political agenda too. And they're less likely to take it seriously. Right. That's it's the, the Andre the giant approach to all of it. Exactly. You keep using that word. I do not, I do think, not think it think means it what means you think it means. means. <laughs> but, but we've seen this happen. Mm-hmm. And when Joe Biden goes on TV saying that this law which is in no way racist. Right. And I mean, like, even if the water thing were true, like only black people get thirsty, white people don't get thirsty. Like how, how would that be disenfranchising specifically black people? Even right. if it were the case. Right. Um, but anyway, that aside, when he says this is Jim Crow 2.0, I got to sit there and be thinking, how does that sound to a person that actually lived through Jim Crow? Right. Right. I mean, that, it, not being able to have a campaign worker walk up to you and give you free water in exchange for a vote, that's the same thing as having hoses and dogs turned on you. Or being told you. which fountain you're allowed to drink from. Right. That doesn't make any sense. Right. And so I, it just diminishes their experience and right. actual occurrences of real racism. Right. And, and that's the thing is that one of the things that this entire movement has done has tried to uh, minimize the voices that did live that. 
uh, the Shelby Steeles of the world, the Thomas Moores of the world, these people who, who really experienced it, those voices are now being ostracized and thrown out alongside Huck Finn novels. So it, 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 And Dr. Seuss. Right. And so those voices that are about experiencing this negativity of the human condition and persevering through it and learning from it so as to not repeat it, those are the voices that we need to turn to can't hear them anymore like they are they're ostracized from from the halls of power and from the, even even the window of popular conversation the overton window itself like you can't talk about those anymore because the idea that shelby Steele is not uh not a a and, and the word slips my mind as i'm here the idea that shelby Steele is not an expert on the lived experiences of racism in America mm -hmm. and we should throw him out and not listen to him is a problem. And that's what happens when Amazon takes down Shelby Steele's movie, when Amazon doesn't want to sell Shelby Steele books, that's what's happening. And so there's no point of reference for people. Well, and ultimately it does go back to the idea that this kind of what I was saying just a second ago that, um, the reason that, that is the way that people view racism when people say it a lot of times is it's just somebody trying to get their way politically or it's just about a political opinion mm -hmm. is because there is a certain class of people that will deem actual racism not racism if it doesn't fit their agenda. Yeah. And then will reverse it and call things that are not racism racism right. when it does. And so to them, racist becomes just a meaningless term that means something that I politically dislike. Right. And that's the problem. That is the problem. Um, um, it's not just that they're diminishing real experiences of racism. They're completely taking it away and making it mean something completely different. Right. You're, you're, you're redefining the term. Right. Uh, and when you do that, you move completely away from the entire idea of if, if you read, obviously everybody knows the I Have a Dream speech, but if you read any of, of Dr. King's other speeches, mm -hmm. the entire idea that he pushes is the individual idea of, of a human being and their character and who they are absent of any of the external things like skin color. Like that's the idea is the promotion of the content of character. And those things can't be evaluated at all. Those things can't be considered at all. They, everything has to be considered through the prism of tribalism. And, and the idea of an individual is now gone because an individual is a problem for the collective. And to go back to your broader idea from earlier, right. The whole thing is a push for, for the collective. And so the older I get, I think the more I realize that Mike Judge actually had a pretty good handle on the world. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'll always remember, I think it was season one of King of the Hill. There's, uh, it may have even been the first episode um, where Hank Hill's neighbor moves in and he's a Vietnamese guy, but he's a real jerk. And he and Hank don't get along with each other. And Hank begins to voice that he doesn't like him. And, and his wife says, now, Hank, you don't want people to think you're racist. And he just says, what kind of world is it if I can only hate a man if he's white? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, point. we laugh at it, but, but that was 20 something years ago. And look where we are now is that you can't comment on any, on anybody as an individual. You have to comment on everything from this tribalistic perspective. And, and it really, it, it shattered the common things that we have because what we have and any student of the Bible knows this, what we have is a whole lot more in common than we have different. Even among Christians and non-Christians, we have a whole lot more in common than we have different. And those are things that aren't even allowed to be discussed anymore. Well, I know that we're going somewhat off the uh, topic that I intended for us to go, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a good subject to discuss, so I'm going to go there anyway. Sure. Um, individualism is a solely Judeo-Christian idea. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist pre-exist i mean obviously it's always existed because it's an eternal truth but what i'm saying is the idea was not popularized in the known world until the spread of christianity outside of jerusalem right and so the interesting thing there is pagans did not think that every other god didn't exist mm -hmm. they believed that all the gods existed it's just that my god is better than your god mm -hmm. and they thought of it in terms of and, and this is why there were things like blood feuds mm -hmm. um if one of your guys kills one of our guys, then it doesn't matter if we actually kill the slave or if we actually kill um, the guy that uh, did the murder. Mm -hmm. We just have to have some member of your tribe to sacrifice 
in order for it to be fair. They view people as a group, as right. a collective. Judaism and then later Christianity was the first way of thinking in human history that was like, no, everybody's created by God. Everybody's an individual. He's accountable for his own actions and nobody else's. Right. And justice means carrying out punishment for sins committed on the offender, mm -hmm. not anybody else. And so I know that as Westerners, we're just kind of accustomed to that, but we're regressing into that now. Yeah. That as long as we take a pound of flesh from someone of your tribe, doesn't matter if you actually did anything wrong or not. Right. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's over 100 years after slavery was ended. We have to take some money from white people now to make up for past uh, offenses against us, even if you've never done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And and it's th that whole mentality has unfortunately just we, – we have regressed back into a form of tribalistic paganism. Mm -hmm. And we call it progressive. Because yeah. I don't think that word means what you think it, it means. It, it is funny how often progressivism has led us into something that is thousands of years old and actually cuts against the newest idea, uh, which is free market capitalism, which is only about, you know, 200-ish years old. Right. But yeah. Anyway. All right, man. Well, it has been a great interview. I yeah, really I enjoyed you. it. And right. uh, is there anything that maybe I wouldn't have thought to, to talk about or maybe something that I would have missed that you'd like the audience to know? Um, no, I mean, I think, I think we're pretty thorough. Um, I, the big thing it just comes down to is like ma major league baseball is no different than every other corporation than, than every other business. Um, the pe the thing that people need to realize is corporations don't have ideas. Corporations have one agenda, one agenda only make money, right? Do business. Like Rob Manfred's really bad at that part, yes. but, but that's their idea. And so if you believe Starbucks believes this thing, they don't. If the culture changes, Starbucks is going to change with them. If you believe that baseball believes this thing, it doesn't. As the culture changes, baseball is going to change with it. And so the best thing that people can possibly do is just cut it off. Like, go enjoy the things that you enjoy and... And step away from all of this other stuff. And it's, it's the only way we're ever going to take it back. It's, it's basically giving society its own cognitive therapy. Like taking the power out of this, stop giving it meaning. If it doesn't have meaning, then it can't bring you anxiety. True. And so the reality is it stinks that I can't take my eight-year-old to the home run derby this summer. Really does. But at the same time... I could say, you know what, we're boycotting the Home Run Derby. We're not going to watch the Home Run Derby. But that punishes my 8-year-old because he loves the Home Run Derby. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to watch baseball. And we're not going to talk about, about the other stuff because he's 8 and he doesn't need to know about any of this stuff right now. But I think we have to um, – like, I've, I've heard a big push from Ben Shapiro and others that, that it's time for the right to start – trying to deplatform and cancel the same way that the left does, and they think that's the way to fight back. I think the only way to fight back is to, is to say, no, we just won't be canceled. Like, we're going to do the things we want to do, and we're still going to vote the way that we want to vote, and, and that's the way that it's going to go. And, and so I think that's it, is you have to find ways to engage with people in the common spaces. Baseball is a great spot for that. But the biggest thing, the biggest idea that I'll mm -hmm. leave with you yeah. um, before I go get my son and take him to a baseball game that he's playing in is stop believing things about people you don't know that are being told to you by other people you don't know. Go talk to your neighbor. That's go basically meet. Twitter. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> That's so the like, thing. like the government tells you these things about white people or about black people, or they tell you these things about conservatives or about the left. And you hear all of these things. Like put the phone down and go talk to somebody you don't know. And what you'll find is that most of the interactions are really positive and that that's the place where you make hay. That's the place where you, where you make society better. And that's, that's what we have to do. And I think as Christians, we understand that. It's, it's under an umbrella that we call the Great Commission. But, mm -hmm. but that's the idea is that you're supposed to go out and love your neighbor and you're supposed to go out and talk with your neighbor and get to know your neighbor. And we're, we live in the most technologically connected society in the history of the world and we've never been further apart. And, it's sad, yeah. Yeah. And, and so conversations and sometimes about important things and sometimes about the weather and sometimes about nothing at all. That's the way that we make the world better. Yeah. And 
here's the thing, Jeremy. I agree with that, and I want that to be the case because you know I me. Mean? I love my baseball. Mm -hmm. I, I do. I, I love baseball, and I, I, I know that most people aren't in this boat, but. I do politics every day. Right. I don't want it in my baseball. Right. I just want baseball. I'm, I'm tired of it by the end mm -hmm. of the day, and I just want to watch the Braves and, you know, watch them lose. And yeah. That's, that's, that's what they do. Two and four. They're, and they're good at it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, well, we, and we weren't two and four until yesterday. We right. were four, you know, oh and four. Thank you, Pablo Sandoval. Yeah. But anyway, my point in all of that is, and, and where, I, where I'm trying to sort of bring it to a head, is I, I want that to be the case. I want yeah. to be able to just watch my baseball, and even though they, they do occasionally make stupid decisions like this that are politically motivated, that I can still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. However, what I'm worried is going to happen, and I think it's going to come sooner rather than later, is they will make the thing unwatchable. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you paid any attention. I actually did watch it just um, for the sake of, of trying to figure it out. I watched some of the NBA games to see what was going on, because I'm not really an NBA guy. Mm -hmm. um, I watch March Madness, and that's about all the, the basketball that I do. Right. But but I was watching it, and it was nothing but, like, every two minutes, some kind of virtue signaling, Black Lives Matter is literally painted on the court. Mm -hmm. And, like, I could not watch it for more than a few minutes because I was so annoyed at it the entire time. You and I'm that... afraid that they will make it unwatchable. So that's where... If you like, if you're genuinely a believer in capitalism and a free market economy, mm -hmm. that's where you have to trust it to do its job. And I do, um, and and it, and it will. Um, that ultimately, that will happen when you get to that point. That that because what you do, this is the big thing that people have to understand. Like, what you do when you do what baseball has done is you tell a large swath of your fan base. Baseball is largely a conservative fan base especially in the Georgia area. Mm -hmm. like, when you tell a large swath of your fan base, if you support this law, because you're tacitly saying, if you support this law, you're a racist, you've just alienated that fan base. Well, what people learned over the last year is they can get by just fine without sports. Like, they had a year without them. Yeah, see, they that's can... the thing. This is the dumbest possible time right. to do it because people are out of the habit right. of watching it. You're supposed to be trying to bring people back, and now you're alienating them. They can do just fine without sports. That's not a problem at all. And so when the bottom line is affected and it's going to happen, that's when everything swings back. Uh, and it's it's not a fun swing of the pendulum right now, but it will swing back, and and it, it'll be fine. Like, baseball's problem is – as I outlined earlier, COVID, this nonsense, probably a lockout or a strike. Mm -hmm. I don't know if baseball can recover from that. There may be no baseball. You don't have to worry about wokeism in your baseball. There may not be baseball. And so that's their problem. Well, being a believer in the free market, I don't think that that will happen because if there is a desire for something, the market will create it. Now, it may – Well, they're to... killing the desire for it's the issue. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But – what I'm saying is if people genuinely just want to watch baseball, mm -hmm. and I think that there will always be a, a portion of the American people, it may be smaller, um, but there will always be a portion of the American people that want to play and or watch baseball. Right. I think what's eventually going to happen is even if it, it takes a different form or it's called something else, you're going to get baseball in some form. Yeah. Because if but it won't be Major League Baseball. Maybe It'll not. It'll be something else. It, and and that's the, the reality of that threat – existing is what keeps corporations from going too far like that that's the whole idea um so if if there's a threat of something else there's only so far that baseball can go if there's a threat of something else there's only like you've seen it now with the nba all the stuff that was on the court and on the jerseys it's not there now um now it's basketball they they took away because they realized they had gone so far in one direction. I think the, the NFL is starting to realize that right, too. Um, right. And, and that amazed me with the NFL because um, you probably know the history of this a lot better than I do, but uh, they actually made a conscious decision at one point. We're going to be more American even than baseball. Right. And th their logo is red, white, and blue and looks right. like a flag. Right. Um, I mean, everything. They, they did all kinds of salutes to the troops. Mm -hmm. Um all of that stuff and then they just mm -hmm. literally threw it all away within the span of about five years mm -hmm. to where they were even afraid to do anything patriotic so why would the nfl when it did all of that yeah choose to do that 
because again, it all goes back to profits and they were afraid they were going to lose their profit if they didn't allow that to get take place. Right. And now that it's not exceedingly profitable anymore in a post nine 11 world, when patriotism was, was at an all time high, right. That stuff made sense. It doesn't make business sense to do it now, so they don't do it now, which goes back to the point of corporations don't actually have ideas. They don't actually have beliefs. They don't actually have souls. They, they are out to make money. And so any decision that baseball makes, it makes because it thinks that's going to bring it more money. It thinks that the, that the noisy wheel is the majority. It's not, and it, it, it hasn't been. And so ultimately those things will self-correct. Um, and they'll go back into another swing and wh whatever the next thing is, we might like, but we can't fool ourselves into thinking that baseball believes in the thing that we believe in that we like. It doesn't, well, it's as, just baseball. As I said, so. when this whole thing broke out, Jeremy, I don't want conservative baseball. No, I, I just want baseball. I don't want baseball to show up and be like, you know yeah. what? The second amendment's really important. And also, uh, abortion should be outlawed. Like, yeah. I mean, that'd be nice, I guess, but the truth <laughs> is I don't really care. That's right. I just want baseball. Right. Oh, uh, and I, I'm with you. Like, I, that's it. We ju but until we allow the common spaces to be common again, and you right. can't do that until you agree that it's okay to have things in common, then once you get there, it'll be fine. Right. And when one side is threatening to burn down your business, if you don't agree with me, I can understand why that scares people. I I, I'm not saying that that's okay. I'm not saying it's all right to cave. I'm just saying I, I understand the rationale of seeing people that are willing to literally burn down cities. And then when they say, and we'll destroy your business, if you don't agree with us, saying, yeah, they might actually try to do it. Right. So. Um, but anyway, all right, man, well, it's been, it's been great. great I've had a great conversation with you. Uh, that is um, Jeremy Smith, who is the sports information director here at Faulkner university. Thank you so much for being with us, Jeremy. Appreciate you brother. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me. I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.